the ISO 13166 alpha-2 code for uh, country names, French Guiana would be GF. And so for something like that, even if we used uh, if there were two databases, one using an English variant and one using the French version. If you were standardizing it to the ISO code, we would both have GF um, in the database so that when we combined a data set, they would match up. And there's a whole list of the country codes linked here. Other examples for botanists. I'm sorry, I don't know too many good examples for zoology, but we could come up with other lists together. There's the Harvard Index of Botanists, authors of plant names, authors of fungal names. We're very big on standard abbreviations, unique values um, for people who are publishing names of plants and fungi. Um, JSTOR Global Plants created a list of plant collectors that also includes many bio biographies for the collectors. So if you really don't know who you're talking about, you can look it up and validate information that way. A uh, good example for us, uh, Leogier collects in the Caribbean a lot. For the, this is the record from the Harvard Index of Botanists, you can see there are 10 different name variants here. Um, so if you're looking at labels, it's be very hard. You could have to look at under, if you're looking for all of his collections, you'd have to look up every single variant unless you've standardized your data in order to find all of his collections. So it's very important as you're entering um, to have this as a lookup list up front. Institutions is another one. In botany, we have Index Herbariorum, where we standardize all institutions to a single um, acronym for a collection code. We have over 3,000 herbaria listed with 10,000 staff members, um, which is current, constantly being updated. Uh, 105 new herbaria have been added since 2004, uh, with 1,100 new staff uh, members since 2004. What's good about Index Herbariorum is that it's in published, edited version um, a standard that's out there. So Barbatiers at the New York Botanical Garden is the only one who creates and edits all of these records so that it, we can ensure that it's maintained, um, each value is maintained unique. And if you have any updates, she constantly updates it. If your institution is out, out of date or incorrect, please email her and get your institution updated. And why are we doing this? This is very common for um, publishing cited specimens for monographs or floras. You can see you have Q listed here, British Museum, and then you've had the specimens listed. More and more times you're getting the actual barcode numbers of the specimens listed, not just collector collector number. And if you don't know um, what one of the acronyms stands for, you just go to the Index Herbariorum, search for NU, and you can find out that that specimen's at the University of KwaZulu-Natal. And all the information, if you wanted to contact um, you know, the curator of the herbarium, you can get, request that specimen on loan, and so on. Uh, Getting beyond that for you know, more collections, this is, those were just standardized for herbaria. There is an initiative called uh, the Global Registry of Biorepositories to combine Index Herbariorum with the Biodiversity Collections Index, part of the Consortium for the Barcode of Life, to create an online registry for all collections and staff for all taxonomic groups. Museums, herbaria universities, researchers, they're also registering both public and private collections. And this one is going to be a bit more um, automated, so you can actually go to the website and there's a fill out a form right there um, and get your institution added. And when they've combined all the data sets, they've already found 130 institutional identifiers are duplicated. And so this is giving us an opportunity to at least see all the institutions as a whole, and then from there we can then try to make unique identifiers for everyone. And town sort of introduced the concept of scientific names. This is where it gets a bit more complicated and a bit more fun. Um, because we're talking about name strings. And when you start entering name strings in a database without an authority file, uh, especially when you're going directly off of a label, you're going to be dealing with so many different orthographic variants, just not even in terms of spelling the name, but if there's authorships, how um, in plants we standardize the author, so when someone puts in um, an author on a label, they can, Linnaeus is supposed to be L period, but a lot of people write out Linnaeus. Um, and so you're going to get so many different variants of a name string. So when you're talking about an authority file, uh, you might want a synonymized checklist of name strings that includes publication information, 
date, authorship, something that can help you with um, homonyms to distinguish between which name is the right name to use. So do you want to accept the spelling that's written on a label or an orthographic variant? Sometimes it's just incorrect gender. But even if a name is not accepted, it's still important to use the correctly formatted string of any sort of published name. A uh, main example we can give you uh, is in a, a herbarium, a large place, a uh, large section of your herbarium that's not well curated. We recently went through the grasses um, and the asters and tried to curate them in advance of one of our major digitization projects. And we were taking huge aisles of specimens out and transferring them to the correct valid names. And at some point we got so far into Asteraceae that we were never going to finish it and we had to stop and we were just using <coughs> their valid names. We're making sure we're using valid names, but we're going to have to map them to an accepted name um, using the database rather than using what's on a specimen. So in terms of scientific names, you're dealing with both um, managing a collection. So this is can sometimes have very different roles if you are a collections manager versus if you're a researcher wanting to use just the correct um, accepted name uh, in your database records. And many databases nowadays are trying to use um, a filed as name field or a stored under name field so that you can say, okay, this specimen is filed under this name, but the accepted name for this taxon is actually this. So by keeping two names in your database for a single record, you then know where to find the specimen in the herbarium, but you might want to publish online the accepted name for the taxon because people are more likely going to be looking for the specimen under the accepted name, not under a synonym. An example of this, uh, Schweiler coriacea, it has 19 synonyms. And so the accepted name um, is fine. If, uh, for us, it's not so bad because we have a specialist in Lysith in Lysithidaceae, he makes sure all these synonyms are filed under Schweiler or Coriacea. But if you have a specimen with Lysithis peruviana on it and it's filed under Lysithis peruviana and you have specimens filed under Schweiler or Coriacea, your users aren't going to know to look in the second location within the one single collection. And so it's really important that, as Tom was mentioning with the bird collections, if you're giving your users only a certain option certain you know, number of options to use, then you're going to make, force them to say, well, this, why isn't listed this Peruviana in the lookup list for the collection? And so it will give them the opportunity to either look at an authority file and find what the accepted name is for the taxon. It gives you the opportunity to curate your herbarium at the time. You can move the specimen under the correct name, or at least gives you a way to flag the record in the database that, well, it may be filed under this name, but the accepted name is this. There are many examples of taxonomic resources. This list doesn't even cover half of them. And it all depends on the group you're in. Catalog of Life is one of the main ones. The International Plant Names Index and the Plant List are main ones. For Fungi Index Fungorum, there's Zoobank, uh, World Register of Marine Species, Miridae, ScaleNet. Uh, the list goes on and on. We can actually, uh, I can give you a list of some of the other resources on the thumb drives a little bit later. But whatever group you're working on, there's probably a list out there. And if there's not, get together with your colleagues and put one together. They're very useful for um, databasing. And if you're pulling data authority files out from other institutions or from uh, published databases, check to see if those authority files have identifiers. If you're creating one within your own institution, a lot of people tend to do this. You just are building your own little um, checklist in-house. But if you're mapping to something like the International Plant Names Index, they publish identifiers for every name string that they have. And so by embedding that identifier as you are database into your database structure, you may not be looking at the identifier, you may only be looking at the name string, but by embedding that identifier, should IPNI ever update the record, maybe this is spelled wrong, they update the, the specific epithet. As long as you've got that, your name strings now lo no longer match, even though you originally got your name string from IPNI, if they modified it, they're now different. 
But the IPNI ID will stay the same. So as long as you've embedded that ID into your system, then you can just match up IDs and you can get the updates from IPNI later on. So keep that in mind if you are downloading resources um, online from other, other authorities. So standardizing data will make finding your data easier for you and others. Uh, especially if you're doing working with collections management, when you have people coming in to visit your collection, a lot of people want to know what you have up front. And by keeping all this information standardized, you can easily say, well, we have 10 specimens of Schweiler coriacea under, and we've looked at all the other 19 synonyms. We know that there are that many specimens. And using established controlled vocabularies in your, your discipline will make combining your data with others easier. So when you've then mapped all of your data to Darwin Core and you're putting it into GBIF, if you've standardized this, it's going to make users around the world <coughs> and your data sets merge with other data sets a lot more easier. And that way you can find more information. If you're creating a database just for your own research, you're going to want other, you're going to hope that other people have also standardized their data so you can use that um, more easily as well. So as you're going through this course and you're developing and choosing your own database structure, decide up front if any of the fields, and go field by field, if any of the data elements would benefit from having a controlled vocabulary and establish something before you start doing a major data entry project, because then you'll save yourself a lot of cleanup at the end. <laughs>